Barbara K. For any committed follower of journalism in Canada, this will be a familiar name. She has been a regular columnist with the National Post and her work has been featured in publications worldwide. In her writing, Barbara provides insightful perspectives on everything from current news to the sociological factors of sexism. Most recently, she has written about the Jessica Yaniv case, where a trans woman, born biologically male and retaining male genitalia, has initiated human rights tribunal cases against several female waxologists who refuse to wax her male genitalia. She also has recently written about the potential long-term effects of the legalization of marijuana, anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, and other provocative topics. Her work is featured at barbarakay.ca, and she is with me by Skype today. So Mrs. K, thank you so much for being with me today by Skype. Let's start with Jessica Yaniv. Obviously, you wrote uh, the article here. It's about one week old as of the, the taping of this interview. Uh, you've also had some back and forth on the issue on Twitter. Talk to us about what you're seeing happening with this case and why you think this has serious implications for our nation. Uh, this case has, uh, it's been a magnet for all kinds of people to write about, uh, certainly on Twitter. It's been huge. And uh, the the one of the publications I write for, the postmillennial.com, has been front and center with this issue. Uh, it's a real hot potato because we have an individual, this Jessica Yaniv, sometimes known as Jonathan Yaniv, uh, is a biological male uh, who is representing as transgender who has uh, taken a number of women, 16 women, uh, cosmeticians, to the Human Rights Tribunal uh, on the grounds that they, he's been discriminated against because they have refused to wax his genitals. They do, they do uh, professional waxing for women. And uh, since he considers himself a woman, a woman uh, that's his gender, then he, he, of course, thinks he's being discriminated against be he is a very troubled individual. He is a he is a racist. He is um, a compulsive uh, uh, teller of uh, well. I don't want to get into all his pathologies, but there are many, and they've been evident and demonstrated. So uh, this is somebody that the Human Rights Tribunal could have found out very quickly was uh, not a bona fide complainant, and that the actual complaint itself uh, was frivolous at the very least and uh, extremely uh, uh, has very negative implications uh, at worst, and they should not have taken this case. The fact that they did um, tells you that the law prompting their understanding of why they should take the case, Bill C-16, which, which makes uh, gender identity and gender expression uh, a human right uh, under our charter, uh, has led to the uh, the nonsense of women um, being made to feel uh, harassed uh, because they re they do not want to touch a male's genitals, and besides that, they are not trained to to wax, uh, which re it requires a different technique. But that's besides the point. No woman should be forced to handle a man's genitalia if uh, if she doesn't want to, and that's what. Um, if they if they judged in his favor, that's what they would basically be saying that if a if a man, biological man thinks he's a woman, then uh, a, a, a woman should be forced to handle uh, his very real, not abstract, but his very real genitals. Wow. Uh, so I just want to say, as a woman, I concur. <laughs> so thank you for your your uh, force of reason and the sanity that you're bringing into this conversation. So you mentioned the title of your article was as absurd as it is the Jessica Yaniv case has serious implications. So if uh, Jessica wins, uh, what do you see the implications being? Well, I see, for one thing, um, cosmeticians everywhere would be at risk of being harassed by men who would see this as an opportunity to have their genitals touched by women uh, who might, men who don't identify as women uh, might see this as, well, this is my right. Uh, this would force a lot of cosmeticians out of business. A few of the women that, that he took to the Human Rights Tribunal have already uh, abandoned their business because they, they've, under this, they, they feel anxious, they feel um, uh, threatened. And uh, they just don't want to do this anymore uh, because a lot of this was taking place in their homes, by the way. You know, they were doing this business out of their homes and some of them were immigrants. They were vulnerable people. 
the poorest people or people that don't have a huge choice of of uh, jobs. They don't have a lot of job skills. They don't have a lot of self marketing opportunities. So uh, here you have a you know a biological male taking advantage of this vulnerability and everybody pretending, everybody involved at the Human Rights Tribunal, pretending that this is something that should be taken very seriously because in this very deluded and pathological male person's mind, um, they are female. And uh, what they believe about themselves is now the arbiter uh, of what uh, real women, actual women, are being forced to endure uh, in order to make them feel uh, that their gender expression is being honored. It, it's a very serious case. And as I said in my column, it could lead to, and I, I actually expect it will lead to wi biological men uh, demanding treatment from gynecologists on the grounds that since they believe they are women, uh, gynecologists need to um, need to treat them and to accept them as patients, even though they uh, cannot. Um, they cannot treat the anatomy uh, of a male, even though this is an anatomy focused uh, discipline. And I could see the day when the uh, universities would, uh, medical schools would say, well, uh, it is an entitlement uh, and, and it is unfair and it's discriminatory for there to be a branch of medicine that only deals with, uh, phys with physically or uh, biological females. That's discriminatory uh, and therefore uh, gynecologists henceforth will have to study male ana anatomy and male pathologies in order to deal with transgender women. Um, who wish to be treated by gynecologists. It, 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 I, I could see that coming. Wow. So really this invokes the question of when does the defense of the rights of one group of individuals lead to the abuse of another group of individuals uh, and potentially the sexual abuse of, I, I can't, you know, I would, I would call being forced to touch a man's genitalia uh, sexual abuse. There's people watching this right now that are alarmed and maybe even feeling a little bit powerless, you know, as we're seeing this creep, creeping barrage of liberalism, uh, you know, basically edge across our nation on various frontiers. What would you say, Barbara, to the average Canadian out there who's concerned and alarmed about what we're talking about today? Yes, I, I mean, it's a very tough question to answer because uh, on these issues, the average person does not feel they have a voice because the space seems to be taken up by uh, activists um, and uh, ideologically driven uh, people in systemically uh, in education, especially in the media and uh, the academy, which is, of course, uh, dominated uh, by people who, who actually do believe that this nonsense uh, is, is uh, you know, uh, they, they really believe in the rights of people like uh, Jessica Yaniv uh, to be heard or to, at least to uh, to to get a hearing. And so they're they're very much in their corner. Either that or if they can see that it's nonsense and many of them do, they keep silent. There are many media people out there that are not uh, even covering this case because of how bad it looks uh, for the whole trans movement. So one of the things that people can do is they can write to the media that are not covering it properly, like the Toronto Star and uh, uh, the CBC and uh, Canada Land, uh, that are keeping fairly silent on this, or else they're giving it not the kind of coverage it deserves, and say, hey, this is a very serious issue. You're not doing your part here. You know this guy's crazy. Uh, this, is, this, is, this should not be at the Human Rights Tribunal. Why aren't you saying so? That's one thing. Uh, another thing that everyone has the right to do and the ability uh, to do is to write to their member of parliament and to say, um, I don't like to, I don't like what I'm seeing here. Uh, this is having a deleterious and negative effect on our culture. Uh, you are my only avenue to the government. Uh, if you're not prepared to be a voice for sanity on this issue, I will give my vote to somebody who will be. And if you can get a lot of people to do that or petitions, um, these do have an effect uh, if they're if they're properly organized. It does take time and effort. That's those are, these are the, the traditional ways to express your displeasure with uh, a change in the cultural environment. And um, there are sure certainly a lot of people out there who are really sick of this. Unfortunately, uh, a lot of politicians are very timid to put themselves out there on this issue because they fear 
the backlash from uh, the activists, very powerful. Uh, they've infiltrated, you know, psychological associations, uh, endocrinology associations. Uh, they're very, very strong systemically uh, throughout our culture. And that that does put the average person at a disadvantage, no question. Mm -hmm. Now, would you call this systematic nationwide bullying? Yes, it is bullying uh, because a lot of innocent people and particularly children are being harmed uh, by this ideology. I, a couple of weeks ago, I wrote up the case of um, the Buffoni family who have taken their case uh, to the Human Rights Tribunal against uh, teachers and and uh, the superintendent of the of their school district for uh, the distress caused to their daughter in grade one who was told by her teacher there's no such thing um, as boys and girls and uh, you know girls aren't real and boys aren't real like she was teaching gender fluidity to six year olds who have no ability to absorb or understand such a an abstract theory it's not a it's not even an, it's not even a scientific it's not even a, a fact it's a theory um so she's taking them to the human rights tribunal i doubt that she'll win because the human rights tribunals uh, as we see in the jessica and eve case the fact that they they are willing to give it consideration tells you that they already have uh, a bias because no unbiased person could look at this individual and look at what he's doing to these 16 women and say that this guy has a case, uh, you know, uh, for having been discriminated against. So they should have just, you know, tossed it out and said, "Look, you're you're not well. Uh, we're not we're not accepting this case." Mm -hmm. Now we also have the case of the BC father uh, who is not allowed to refer to his child as by their biological gender, and if he does, he will be charged with inciting family violence. And one thing that really um, touched me, I want to say, about this case is his compassion and genuine concern for his daughter because he was basically saying, you know, listen, uh, the science isn't in on gender conversion therapies, gender conversion uh, surgeries. He said, you know, I just want to see this process slow down a little bit so I can dialogue with my child on the potential long-term implications. Have you done any study or given any thought to the long-term implications of children having surgeries and taking drugs to gender transition before the science is really in on it? Yeah, I, I, I have uh, paid a lot of attention to this topic and I have written a fair amount on it. I, I do find it, uh, again, you've got ideology-driven pseudoscience. Uh, dominating the discussion so that uh, people who are vulnerable to accepting, uh, the, you know, what I call indoctrination, you know, like teachers uh, in teacher's ed, uh, teaching these these theories as facts, they are not science driven. We The one thing we know f from science is that children who present as the opposite uh, gender in early childhood, uh, most of them will, after puberty, uh, return to comfort in their biological sex. Many of them will turn out to be either gay or lesbian, uh, and to rush uh, to to rush to um, uh, you know giving these kids hormones that that change their bodies, change their um, their social integration, change a lot of things um, on the basis of childish perception. Uh, is to me, in, in many cases, I'm not saying that gender dysphoria does not exist. Of course it exists. It's a real thing. And very often, uh, children who present very early, uh, it turns out that, yes, some of them do have this condition and it's going to last the rest of their life. But they are a minority. Uh, most of the children who will say, I think I'm a boy or I think I'm a girl or whatever, um, after puberty, they are going to say, well, you know, after all, I'm pretty comfortable with who I am, and and that is something to keep in mind. What we're seeing now uh, is actual encouragement, where there doesn't need to be encouragement. And the father that you mentioned um, is, to me, expressing uh, a perspective that any responsible, sane parent should be uh, holding with regard to their children, because uh, the, the the first thing is not to not to harm your child, and waiting 
uh, you know, to see if this is going to be a permanent, um, a, a permanent condition. It seems to me uh, the least one could do to ensure, uh, you know, once you've done surgery, once you've once, especially once you've taken cross hormones in after puberty, your 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 physical characteristics are altered. Some of them are altered permanently, and you run the very high risk of infertility, even if you stop taking them um, later on. So, I, I feel for that father. I I really do. Wow, wow. So we have other things that are not accessible to Canadians until they're over 18. Uh, perhaps this should be one of those things. And, uh, you know, you mentioned earlier about how we have a voice. This is an election year. Um, the good news is, is that our, our members of Parliament, uh, current and candidates seeking to be members of Parliament are going to be knocking on Canadians' doors. And so um, I would assume you would maybe encourage people to be raising some of these issues. Any other thoughts on this before we shift into the marijuana conversation? Yeah, I, I would encourage uh, uh, people, parents, uh, anyone who's concerned about this issue to raise it uh, with candidates and to tell each candidate that they are going to ask, uh, you know, what they intend to do about it and uh, that you're going to be giving your vote to the one you feel is going to be representing your point of view. Certainly, uh, they should be very uh, proactive in doing that. Uh, to be realistic, I don't think I don't think um, a significant number of Canadians are tuned into this issue because it's not affecting them. They they hear things, but they're not they're not do, digging into it in any great depth. And because they believe that educators have the best interests of their children at heart, so they tend not to challenge uh, what their kids are learning in school. Many of them don't even know what they're learning in school because unless a child brings it home, and many don't. Uh, they have no idea that their kids are being taught there is no such thing as real boys and real girls. Hmm. Wow. Uh, I want to read a quote. Uh, this is the second last paragraph from your article on the Jessica, Jessica Yaniv situation. The trouble with democracy, one trouble anyway, is our complacency. We're too trusting. We think our liberties are well protected in law. So with that, talk to your members of parliament and candidates. Good summary? Yes, that is a good summary. <laughs> There you go. Okay, so let's talk, let's switch gears here and let's talk about your other article that you uh, produced recently. Pot's legal, but we may come to regret that. You know, this one really smacked me in the gut because I actually live in the Niagara region all around us. You know, we are smelling marijuana because of the, the growing, the, the greenhouses that are being taken over by marijuana businesses. There's a high school that's being built right next to a mega marijuana warehouse. Um, Unpack this for us. Well, marijuana <clears throat> is legal. Uh, and in fact, Canada was the second country to legalize it. So only one other country, Uruguay, had legalized it before Canada. And it was rushed. It was really rushed in the sense that uh, this is a, a drug that um, many claims are made for it. Many positive claims are made for it. Uh, oh, it's first of all, it's Three, three claims are made that are not true. One, that it's harmless. Uh, two, that it will end illegal uh, black market uh, marijuana production and sales. Uh, and three, that it's actually therapeutic uh, for any number of conditions. And uh, only the third one is even partially true because it does seem to have uh, a positive effect for certain quite restricted conditions, uh, I hear that it, it works quite well for glaucoma, but then so do real drugs, um, and that it can uh, ease nausea uh, after chemo for cancer patients. Uh, but that's only been measured against a placebo. So measured against actual other drugs, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, and of course, uh, the main ingredient is not the psychoactive uh, THC component, but the oil, the cannab cannabis oil, uh, which does not get you high. So uh, without getting into too much detail about that, uh, the main claim is that it was harmless. And uh, that claim is made by activists and those who have a stake, either, you know, usually an economic state stake in the marijuana business. Uh, it is not harmless. We know that now for a certainty. Uh, but the a lot of the warning studies that are absolutely credible, there nobody is even even those most engaged 
in uh, pro propagandizing for marijuana can no longer deny that the link between um, adolescent use of marijuana and uh, the onset of psychosis is established and real, and uh, it is uh, a deep concern for researchers who feel uh, that, at least in Canada, their warnings uh, were given short shrift. Uh, they've been heard much more in other places. In the United Kingdom, for example, where a lot of these studies were done, the, um, the warnings about uh, the advent of uh, psychosis and the implications for uh, schizophrenia um, have been heard to the extent that marijuana use has actually, even though it is not legal in Britain, it might be, there's a campaign there too, um, marijuana use has gone down in the United Kingdom, but it has gone up significantly here. And that's largely due to the fact that um, researchers here that were investigating the link uh, could not get their voices heard. And uh, the people, it seems to me, at Health Canada um, were not... Uh, how shall I say, receptive uh, to some of the loudest voices that were uh, talking about the harms of marijuana. They were uh, quite susceptible to the blandishments of voices like uh, the Emery uh, husband and wife team who are, you know, going to benefit so much financially. They were heard. They've been campaigning for years, uh, of course. And uh, what's the what's the husband's name? It's Jody and, uh, sorry, Mental Block. Uh, Emery, anyways, the one who went, to, he was willing to go to prison over adult. They were heard uh, by Health Canada, but some of the uh, top researchers on the harms of marijuana were not heard. So mm -hmm. we're finding out more and more that I find very concerning. Uh, women smoking to ease nausea in pregnancy, uh, that's something they should not be doing. Uh, there's more and more evidence suggesting uh, that there are harms associated with that. You know, marijuana is a fat-soluble drug, unlike alcohol, and fat-soluble drugs stay, like alcohol, once it's out of your system, it's out of your system, you know, and there's, we know how long it takes for a certain amount of alcohol to leave your system. Marijuana, uh, it, since it's stored in fat, um, and there's a lot of fat around your brain, by the way, and it's stored in fat around other tissues uh, and other organs, can stay in your body for weeks, uh, undetected, uh, unknown, so... Um, there, really, there's just, I'm, I'm not a researcher myself, but you don't have to be a rocket scientist to read the conclusions of the research. You don't have to be all that brainy to know that when a government study, uh, comes out, you know, from the National Association of Medicine, say, uh, this is a study you can give credit to, and it's not coming from somebody's blog, you know, who's, Who's uh, who's got a stake in in um, uh, in something that you know an anti marijuana drug? I don't know. I mean, it, it's easy to find credible sources, and and it's easy to know which are credible and which aren't. Uh, and credible sources are are sending strong warnings uh, about the negative effects of cannabis, especially in young people. So it's quite concerning because since legalization, uh, many many new users have come on stream. Uh, and in the first quarter of 2019, uh, we know that 646,000 new users have started marijuana for the first time since it became legal. Uh, that's a significant number. Mm. Wow. Now, you alluded to the documented research on the negative impacts of the brain development and the mental state of particularly young people who use this, uh, who use marijuana. And I, I know Dr. Harold Collant from the University of Toronto has basically said somewhere between 22 to 25 is probably the marker where uh, the human brain has developed to full capacity. And he advised strongly uh, the parliamentary committee reviewing this that it should not be legalized before that time frame in an individual's life. Uh, parents that are watching this interview right now that have 14, 15 year old kids, uh, do you, are you aware of any sources that they could go to to educate their children seeing as this is has been legalized for 18 year olds? There are there are web, there are websites. Um, I'm trying to think of the name of uh, you know. I'm sorry, I didn't come prepared with those names uh, to this interview. No problem. But I could you know I could send you a few links afterwards. Uh, yes, if you uh, if you Google around, you will find that first of all there there are many uh, organizations in Canada 
the uh, I'm trying to remember the name of the there's one that's foremost um, uh, the the drug abuse network something something okay so my bad I should have come with all these names written no I'm I'm putting you on the spot here it's my fault not yours but we'll we'll research and put it up on the screen here so it's all good but there are resources so Google is your friend. yeah there are there are and you know the the, the trouble is that if it, if when you mention the names of these oh these people these are uh uh these are all prudes and they're or they're radical fundamentalists exactly exactly <laughs> they'll say all the same things that you you know uh i mean i remember in 2008 when i was up against my editorial board and they teased me they said oh yeah reefer madness ha 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 like you know, you're. They called me a Miss Grundy. Uh, that I didn't. I, I was against people having fun. And uh, actually, one of the questions uh, they put to me in an editorial was, "Well, would you have not legalized alcohol and tobacco?" And I said, "If if people knew in 1600 when tobacco was first cultivated, uh, or cigarettes for for inhaling," uh, I said, "If." If if they had known then what we know now, I am sure it would have been made illegal at the very beginning. And then nobody you wouldn't have had millions and millions and millions of people who enjoyed smoking and who were addicted to it uh, to contend with. And you wouldn't have had all the money it brings into government uh, to be motivated not to lose. So uh, as for tobacco, yeah, I think we would have seen it banned if we had known when when it was before that barn door was open and the horse ran out. The difference between alcohol and marijuana at presently is that anyone who takes their first drink today is absolutely aware of the danger of falling into addiction or of abusing it or of driving under its influence or working under its influence or doing anything except relaxing under its influence. Nobody is trying to hide any of the bad, the negative aspects of alcohol, and not even the people who are, you know, weenophils or who own vineyards or who love, you know, wine. I happen to like wine very much. I have it almost, you know, every night with my dinner, I have a glass of wine, but I would never, uh, if somebody says to me, but alcoholism, I would never say, oh, no, 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 it, it's not so bad as you think. Like, of course, of course, I'm right there saying, yes, we must do everything we can to reduce the harms uh, and try to get kids from becoming addicted and, and abusing alcohol. Uh, so however we could, but the difference is that with marijuana, you're not hearing that. You're not hearing that from responsible people. You're not hearing it from educators. You're not hearing it um, from doctors, uh, doctors even who are prescribing it for pain relief or whatever, uh, they don't say, now, look, I want you to understand there's a danger here. And so the government didn't say uh, we're not we're not we're not regulating this for the use of, of people under the age of 25, even though that that is what the research is saying. Uh, so there's a lot of misleading or suppressed um, evidence uh, around cannabis that you do not find with other drugs like cocaine or heroin or alcohol or anything else. And that's my beef. I'm not saying turn it around and, and, and delegalize it. That's not going to happen. What I'm saying is I want the government to be transparent. I want Health Canada to be transparent and more than transparent, proactive. They should be warning women. On their website, Health Canada says, uh, we don't advocate uh, the use of marijuana in pregnancy and women should be, you know, uh, very cautious and very prudent. Like they, they say that, but you have to go to their website to find that. Mm -hmm. Why isn't there an education campaign out there now saying if you're using cannabis, marijuana uh, for nausea in early pregnancy, you are taking a risk and the risks are. And then you would do like low birth weight, uh, premature birth. Um, then there's a host of other metabolic possibilities that 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 honest research uh, is coming to. They just don't know. And, and I think in the next 10 years, we'll see exponential growth in the kind of research that shows that uh, the editorial board who laughed at me when I said we have to be more cautious, we have to learn more. And and I linked, you know, with schizophrenia and they laughed at me. Uh, that was in 2008. They're not laughing now. Uh, they're 
they're not apologizing, but <laughs> they're certainly not laughing because half the research or most of it hadn't even been done yet in 2008. And now it's there. Now it's very, very clear uh, what the links are. And we'll, we'll find out links to other stuff too. I'm quite sure. So uh, I, all I want is the government to be honest. I want uh, them to uh, be very upfront, you know, about uh, the risks that people take. And it's not harmless. It is not harmless. Wow, so insightful. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for being a voice on this issue. So obviously right now, this is landing in the hands of parents and loved ones to get informed and make sure the people in their world are informed about the potential negative impacts of, of marijuana use. Um, government and honesty. I want to just talk about that for a second at the close of this, and then maybe we'll shift into, into some thoughts about the election before we close here. But, you know, it seems like there has been a repeated behavior of the current administration anyway, and perhaps every administration's like this in some way, of censoring anything that opposes their agenda, uh, or maybe censorship is, is too strong of a word, um, uh, systematically resisting <laughs> um, anything that would oppose their agenda. Perhaps this is one of those examples where we know that the Liberal government campaigned on the legalization of marijuana. Uh, you alluded to the fact many times uh, in your sharing there that uh, it seems like the, the media is for some reason uh, ignoring or has been ignoring the, the negative research about marijuana use. Do you think there's a direct link to the fact that this was a government policy that they had pushed in the last election? Well, I, th I think uh, there's a lot of synergy there. Uh, we have a government that is uh, led by an extremely progressive prime minister who ha who himself has these by he came to office with these biases. Uh, so he's I mean, this is this is a prime minister who won't allow in his caucus or even to run for office. Uh, anyone who believes uh, who, who does not believe that abortion is a, a fabulous thing, you know, who who is pro-life. So if you actually actively say you can't run for office in, in my party, if you hold those views, uh, then you're the kind of person who does believe in shutting down uh, freedom of conscience, uh, freedom of thought, freedom of expression. Um, you know, uh, uh, as a general rule, I mean, you think that you have discovered the only way to think on an issue and anybody who disagrees with you is not only uh, wrong, but that their views should be suppressed. So I, I, I think this is a general message from government. But apart from that, I think uh, most of our media and even including um, even on the National Post uh, editorial board, which, of course, the National Post is a right of center paper, but still on the editorial board, you have several people who identify as libertarians when it comes to personal behaviors. So um, they feel very strongly, they believe in individual liberties. And, and because uh, some of them, I, I think, are very uh, sympathetic to the, uh, to the marijuana campaign, they, I don't think, did their homework. Uh, they, weren't, they weren't motivated to do their homework because they already thought Everybody should have the right. Well, if you're allowed to drink, you should be allowed to uh, smoke. And they, they, it seems to me, not a lot of effort was was put into investigating the other side of the argument because they weren't pushed to. Um, so uh, the media in general is very liberal. But just to step back a moment and look at that word liberal, um, you know, Fatine, I sometimes think that we have to, the words conservative and liberal, honestly, Maybe they're a little outmoded now. Uh, I personally, although I identify as a conservative, I actually think I'm a classical liberal because I don't think liberalism as it was once practiced uh, and with which I agreed when I was young, I saw nothing wrong with liberalism as it was practiced in my youth. Um, but that doesn't exist anymore. It's progressivism. We have people that have moved so far left uh, that it's wrong, I think, to call them liberals. And I think that many conservatives who, um, you know, I, I, I hold views that I still did uh, many, many years ago, but I called myself a classical liberalism. I believe in freedom of expression above. That's one of my prime values. But liberals today who are actually progressives, they don't believe in freedom of expression. Uh, <clears throat> they believe in not giving offense <clears throat> to certain groups identity groups. So identity politics 
is not what I would call liberalism. It's, it's progressivism, socialism, Marxism, whatever you want, but it, it's not what I used to think of as liberalism. Uh, you know, we can get caught up in these words. What do they mean? Let's define them. Uh, but, um, you know, classical liberals used to believe in the individual as uh, the metric for um, rights, not entire groups. Uh, in the Jessica Yaniv case, we, we see that trans women uh, as a group have rights that can invalidate the rights of, of other entire of the majority. Um, this was never the intention of the rights movement, the, you know, that, that liberals began. And um, so it's hard well, nowadays to, it's hard nowadays to, to uh, choose your, your own your label. Yeah. <laughs> well, if anyone could find an, a new appropriate name for the Liberal Party, it would be you. <laughs> so I nominate you. I nominate you to write an article. <laughs> well, they should call themselves the Progressive Party. They should. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk um, election. You know, we've been talking a lot about really freedom rights um, and freedom to have full knowledge, you know, on, on the marijuana issue, freedom to not wax male genitalia if you are a waxologist. Do you feel like the freedom issue is one of the main issues that Canadians should be concerned about at this point in our national history? Or is there something else that you're tracking with? Yeah, I think it's huge. I think that um, a very pivotal point in our uh, cultural history occurred uh, in 2016 with uh, Bill C-16. That was the the bill that enshrined gender expression and gender uh, identity in, uh, in in the Ontario Charter, and that was when Jordan Peterson made his trilogy of videos. That was the, that was the first time that. Jordan Peterson started to become a household name. Uh, I had never heard of him before that. And suddenly I was watching these videos of this psychology professor from the University of Toronto who was saying, I will not be compelled to use pronouns that I don't believe in. And you cannot compel me, but I am telling you, I'm warning you that someday people will be compelled. And if they don't use them, they will run the risk of uh, a fines or imprisonment. And everybody laughed at him and said, oh, come on, you're being over dramatic. Well, he wasn't being over dramatic um, because that father that you alluded to before uh, has been told that he will be punished severely if he does not use his own daughter's preferred pronoun. Um, and uh, we're we're seeing the results of this bill now in the Jessica Yaniv case, in, and we're going to see it more and more. We're, we're seeing it. Uh, many parents have told me uh, that they have been threatened. Oh, one woman in Ontario actually w was more than threatened. The uh, child services came to her and told her uh, that they were considering removing her child from her home because she was telling her child that gender fluidity was not, you know, uh, a thing. And uh, she was going against what the teachers were teaching in school about, uh, you know, gender fluidity. So she won her case. Uh, it was a case. Uh, she won it. But I'm wondering if the next time around a parent, parents will lose their child if they refuse uh, to affirm too early. And if they say, well, we love our child, but we we're going to wait and see. We don't, we, we, we don't want to give um, permission for hormones uh, uh, to a nine-year-old. Like, we just don't. Uh, maybe that child will be removed from their home. I think it's it's quite conceivable. So, um, yeah, I, I, think, uh, I think the state ownership of children has gone pretty, pretty deep at this point. And uh, that's a major issue. Um, so freedom is a big thing for me. Freedom of freedom of speech, especially, uh, mm -hmm. to me, is a very big issue. Would you agree? You just mentioned um, the clampdown on parents' parental rights. Uh, would you agree that we're sort of in a, a repeat of the cycle of what happened with the residential schools, where the government came in and said, "Listen, we know better. We're going to take the Indian out of the Indian. We're going to reprogram that. Is it, reprogram them? Is that basically what's happening right now in the sex issue?" You know, a lot of people might say that that's a very dramatic comparison and, and they might get very offended uh, that it, they would say it's an appropriation of um, 
of of a, a cultural uh, period of of true suffering. Um, so maybe I wouldn't make that exact comparison, but it it is an example of uh, the state saying we know better. It is an example of the state saying, well, we're going to set the terms of uh, what your child learns about gender, even if we don't have scientific basis for it. Um, if, for example, parents are not informed if their children come out at school as trans or if they join uh, one of those gay straight alliance clubs. Uh, they, In other words, uh, they do not include, schools no longer, in some cases, look to the parents as partners in dealing with a child's problems uh, or bring the, the parents in for collaboration on how best to deal with a child who's in distress about one thing or the other. Uh, they're saying, if you do not believe what we have decided to believe about gender and uh, whatever else goes along with it, then uh, you're not fit to parent. That, that's basically what they're saying. You're not fit to parent. We're better fit to parent your, your child than you are. Wow, alarming. Okay, so the good news is uh, we're still free enough that I can interview somebody like you and I can record it and I can uh, put it on Facebook and on our TV show and you can write about it in the, in the National Post next week if you choose to. And so that's good news is that we still have a measure of, of freedom and being able to be a voice. I want to um, close this interview with a little bit of a sentimental question. You are in your 70s, as I understand. Am I correct about that? Yes, 76. 76 years young. I am 44, going to be 45 this year. There's a whole generation That's of thinkers. Age. That's a good age to be. Okay. <laughs> uh, there's a whole generation of thinkers and, and commentators, articulators coming up. What would your advice be to the next generation of nation builders in Canada, um, you know, in addition to anything that you've already said? I think right now the, the most important job that, that the new generation has for those who are, excuse the expression, woke to the fact that, um, uh, that certain freedoms have been hijacked and that uh, they, are, they are going to be educated in institutions that are dominated by a single point of view. Uh, and they will not know even in some cases that they're not getting other points of view. It's, it's very, uh, it's, it's, it's really obligatory for those people like you, Fatine, and others like you who can see that you've been duped and bluffed, um, and, uh, to encourage other young people and to, or parents, uh, to badger the universities the universities have to change. Uh, we need a change of culture at the universities. Um, that's where it all happens. This is where, <clears throat> this is where, well, it happens in the high schools too. It happens, starts happening in kindergarten, obviously. But the main, um, I would say, uh, activation of, of young people's will to change the world, to make the world a better place, it's usually in university when they get that urge to make a difference. But they don't know that they're, what they're learning uh, is very one-sided. And <clears throat> so whatever efforts can be made to uh, change what's going on at the universities or even to boycott the universities um, and to, to tell uh, universities, I'm not going to a university that does not give me a full education, that does not give me the spectrum of thought, uh, that doesn't give me um, a home, an intellectual home uh, in which free inquiry is possible. Um, this is what people like you of your generation uh, have to be activating for so that the incoming crop of young Canadians are getting a fair shake intellectually uh, in these institutions. Otherwise, they go through the universities, then they go into the law schools, and they become lawyers who who believe uh, in compelled speech, as we've seen in the Law Society of Upper Canada. That was a whole other sidebar, but uh, where they want to compel all the lawyers to sign statements of diversity and inclusivity and whatever. Um, then you see them in, uh, they are the educators that are teaching the teachers. So the teachers are learning from ideology-driven 
um, you know, people at OISE, for example, extremely ideologically driven uh, school of education. So it has to change at the university level. How that's going to happen, I honestly, I, I, I don't know, because culture, uh, there is such a thing as a cultural zeitgeist, you know, uh, there is a, a thrust, it's like a tide, you, you can't stop the tide coming in, you can stand there and hold up your hands against it, you know, like King Canute. Uh, there's only so much individuals can do. And, and sometimes you end up becoming a witness to history uh, rather than a player because there was no way in. There was no way uh, to force back this tide. I feel like that sometimes that we're living, um, you know, and we're, we're, we're swimming against the current, but we're not going anywhere because it takes all our strength just to stay in place and not to be washed up, you know, uh, along with all the other wreckage. So, um, this is a very pessimistic message I'm giving you. I'm very sorry, Fatine. I'm sure you were hoping for something more practical and more optimistic and more encouraging than what I'm saying. Right? Well, I, I want to say this. Uh, there's two thoughts coming to my mind. One is that, uh, you know, we need to be people of principle and integrity and do the right thing, whether we see the result or not. And I think history judges people of integrity and courage as heroes and people and history judges people of uh, lack of will, lack of integrity as um, cowards. Right. So I want to be judged as a hero, hopefully, in, in some measure. So uh, so we can we can gird up our loins in that regard. But the other thing, too, is I do have hope in the sense of that we have seen nations shift. Uh, literally on the hinge point of elections. We've seen the United States obviously shift. I'm not giving commentary on, on it one way or another, but we've also, we saw Canada shift in 2015. And, um, you know, I, I, I just have to have faith that as much as we've seen it shift in one direction, that we could see it shift in other directions as well. There's a lot of complacency in Canada. There's a lot of, we're not like the United States. Um, we would never have elected Donald Trump or anybody like him. Although Doug Ford, I suppose, you know, the fact that he got elected uh, does does tell us that there's a lot of unrest uh, around these issues. But will that translate into uh, a change at the polls? I think that uh, in terms of population numbers, I'll be very curious to see uh, the numbers that Bernier pulls in, uh, and if he even wins a seat or two, that that I think would be kind of momentous. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if he does, then those people would be effectively absorbed into the conservative caucus functionally at some level, anyway. So, but they would be a conscience. But they would be. But they would be uh, a gadfly. Wow, well, such an interesting time, uh, Barbara, Mrs. K. I I just want to say thank Barbara, you. Barbara. <laughs> Jeez. Uh, well, I just want to say thank you so much to your your service to our nation uh, for decades now. And I've looked up to you uh, for decades and, and read your work and been impacted by it. I just, from my heart, want to say thank you so much. Thank you for your insightful commentary today. You've given us so much to think about. And uh, I really hope we can do this again, maybe after the election. We can talk about what happened. I hope so, too. I've, I've enjoyed myself. And, and by the way, uh, you're a hero. 18. You're, what you're doing is the right thing, and uh, I admire you. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. Uh, it's an honor to sit at your feet. So uh, have a great rest of the day, and we'll talk again soon. Thanks so much. I look forward to it. Okay.